This is the Liz Harrison Show. Good afternoon. I'm Liz Harrison. Thank you for listening to Vigilant Liberty Radio, or if you're listening in at K98talk.com, thanks for listening there. Uh, it's Thursday, January 29th. I was a little bit distracted before coming on the air today. Unfortunately, started getting little text messages, the automated kind from the news service. We're having foul weather. That's always fun. <laughs> Some schools are letting out early because of freezing rain. Well, that's a good idea, of course. Better than having the school buses go flying down roadways and have children get hurt. And speaking of schools, in spite of all of the snow and everything, we are heading into standardized test season. All of you parents out there know exactly what I'm talking about. If your kids particularly despise them, you get to go through days, if not a whole week, of, I have a tummy ache, I don't want to go to school today. Yeah. And you also get the little threatening notes from the school. And I say threatening because they make it out like this is the be-all and end-all of the scholastic careers of your precious little angels. And, well, it's not exactly true. Basically, uh, there's a little bit of difficulty there. Yes, the state can sit there and say that schools have to give the test, No, they're not going to get away with, I mean, I know maybe some states have tried, they can't get away with sitting there and saying that every student must take them. They cannot take the parental ability to say no away from them. Well, Michelle Malkin is suggesting that we sit there and tell the schools, stuff it, my child is not taking the exam. Of course, if people did this in mass, the whole no child left behind in common core would come into question, I suppose. Because if you don't have people taking the tests, they can't figure out how well or how badly the students are doing. At least that's the theory. Don't expect to see anything like that happen. However... Uh, Malcolm brings up an interesting point in the exams. See, the problem with the exams is you end up with publishing industry people like Pearson taking the lead, borderline monopoly nationwide. So, uh, basically, in Pearson's case, they're, um, they're a publishing and testing conglomerate. And the chief co- corporate sponsor of Jeb Bush, for those of you who are paying attention, they have the uh, park exams, or park tests, Partnership for Assessment of Readiness for College and Careers. If you missed the news earlier in the month, there was a little bit of a kerfuffle about that because we have students graduating from college that are not prepared for white-collar work. Close to 50% of them. So... Well, I'm I'm wondering how well this whole park thing's working out. Of, of course, this is just for grade school and high school. Anyway, yeah, they they started realize uh, a lot of families, teachers, administrators. They started realizing that Pearson was just using classrooms as labs, teach treating students like guinea pigs. 
so there was pressure to withdraw from it. Between 2011, according to Michelle Malkin, between 2011 and 2014, the number of states actively signed up for PARC dropped from 24 plus the District of Columbia to 10 plus D.C. The remaining 10 are Arkansas, Colorado, Illinois, Maryland, Massachusetts, Mississippi, New Jersey, New Mexico, Ohio, and Rhode Island. <coughs> Excuse me. So, um, in New Jersey, however, it might not fare so well because there's an opt-out movement there. And it's booming. Anyway, Park is not doing so well. Pearson is not necessarily doing as well as it used to. But th this made me think, the whole thing here. Because for better or worse, I, I've alluded to it before, I had associations with individuals in education, academia, many years ago. I had been the CEO of a nonprofit organization that produced a, an online literary journal, but we also engaged in educational activities. So when No Child Left Behind came out, I was among the people who were screaming against it, which didn't make me very popular with a lot of Republicans at the time. I didn't really care because I wasn't in politics then. I was generally in agreement with a lot of liberals that were complaining about it because, you know, well, it was Bush and not them. Now they like it because it's common core and they have something to say about it. So there, there goes the high and righteous thinking here. You know, they, they don't like it when it's a Republican in charge. They love it when a Democrat is. Uh-huh. Hypocrisy is thick, folks. But, see, I understood back then the new, No Child Left Behind d would not resolve the educational issues, nor will Common Core. Won't do it. Both of them approach educational reform from the bottom up. And I know that might sound logical to some people, but that simply isn't how it's done. And honestly, No Child Left Behind actually exacerbated a lot of the problems that we had and a lot of the poor educational outcomes we've had because they not, not only did it not address one of the biggest problems with our educational system, but it actually made it worse. Because in that law, there was a fast track to the classroom. This meant that people could end up with a certification to end up standing in front of a classroom and teaching far quicker and far easier than they ever had before. And yes, I screamed to the rafters about that, along with quite a few other people. Now, that law, Common Core as well, which is just you know, a collection of suggested curricula that may or may not be taken over by a given school or district. None of these things actually address the real problem with education in America. And the best part is that all of our legislators, pol public policy people, ignore it, even though we know what it is. They know what it is. We even see how it works if you don't do what we're doing and understand how to make it better because, you know, it's been implemented elsewhere. Granted, it's in a totally different culture, but equivalencies could be made. So what is our problem with education? Um, to place it on a very, very personal level, when I used to be in the academia, I also used to make a little bit of money on the side, reviewing 
master's thesis. This would basically mean that I'd have a master's candidate. And it, usually it would be somebody in English education or literature or some sort of social science that I was extremely familiar with. But they would come to me. I had one that I did as a freebie. I had four that I did as not. And two of the four where I was actually paid, I wanted to bang my head against the wall. Because the work that they did was less intensive than a paper I had done, a research paper, for a sociology course at a community college years before. And one shining star actually did less work than I probably did for a paper in history that merited a B minus, I think, if I remember correctly. It might have been an A minus. I just know the minus ticked me off because the teacher basically yelled at me for not putting a long, longer summary on the paper. That's what it was all about. The rest of the paper was fine. He was just being a jerk. So, yeah, I did more paper or more work on a paper than <laughs> a master's student did. And I, I know you, you're all sitting there thinking, oh, I'm, oh, she's just bragging. If you've read academic work at all, like I had, I had spent way too much time reading academic work, which was why I got into the whole reviewing theses in the first place. Once you have read enough you, and don't ask me what that is, I mean, you reach a point where you realize, oh, this must have taken a very long time to research. You realize this. You can tell by the way it's written, the information that is in, contained in it, the extent of research interviews, etc., that are involved. This is called, you know, you understand the value of the work. And people who read read a lot of books, they can tell when they're dealing with a book that the writer took a lot of time and effort to do it, and then you could tell the ones that were pretty much thrown together in a hurry. And, hey, there's nothing wrong with either one. There are certain cir circumstances where you have to get a book out quick, like you go and check Amazon right now. There are books out there on ISIS. ISIS has not been... <laughs> out there very long, comparatively speaking, especially if you think about the old publication calendar. There is no way that they would have a print book out seven years ago, even, on ISIS, if they were not dealing with the work and publishing schedules that they now have, thanks to ebooks and all of that sort of thing. So, yeah, you can understand when you're dealing with something that didn't take much work, you did it on the fly, it may or may not have, it may or may not have a lot of substance, whatever. But in these cases with these theses, I was ready to scream because these people were going to get a degree in education. They were going to end up in front of a classroom. And I understood very clearly that they really were not prepared and the problem is that the vast majority of colleges and universities do not invest in their education departments. You know, that you've heard the old adage, those who can't do, teach. Well, unfortunately, they take that to heart. And another unfortunate fact is you have certain colleges that will treat their education department like a money mill. They graduate piles upon piles of students in education. But the money doesn't go back into the education department. No, it gets spread out throughout the entire system or it goes to a pet project of the president of the university or college. <sighs> We're doing it wrong. We're doing it wrong. Top-down reform. 
Why are other nations beating us? In other nations, it is more difficult to become a teacher. Think about Japan. We can't argue, you know, they're, they're doing better. <laughs> That's all there is to it. We know this. What does it take to be a teacher in Japan? It's one of the hardest careers to get into. Teaching should not be a fallback position. You know, you get a degree in education because you failed at getting a degree in engineering. No. It should not be a fallback position. Unfortunately, it is. We should have extremely high standards for educators. We should have an extremely rigorous process to become a teacher. Yes, I know people, and I, there is one person who actually broadcasts here on Vigilant Liberty Radio who would probably want to smack me for saying that because she has gone through what is necessary to become a teacher. But uh, this is a, the serious question that needs to be asked. Do you really think that our schools will improve if you keep piling on our students higher standard requirements, sitting there saying, okay, you must perform better, but do nothing about the teachers? Really? How are they supposed to do better if you don't improve the quality of the people that are teaching them? Is, is this supposed to happen by symbiosis? They're going to stick the books on their heads, and the words inside of them are magically going to write themselves in the child's brains. Is that what it is? And, you know, the whole situation with the tests. You sit there and say, well, we can test them to figure out how much they've learned. How many times have we heard the phrase, teach to the test? We've seen this with monkeys. I'm, I'm not comparing children to monkeys here. I am comparing the educational process that we have gotten ourselves into to teaching monkeys simple tasks. Yes, we can teach a monkey to do a lot of different things. But, five years after you teach the monkey something, if the monkey's still alive, will it necessarily remember it? Maybe not. Probably not. Let's borrow the memory from an elephant. Seriously, folks, really. If you're teaching to the test, you aren't teaching the kids to learn. You're, and critical thought is definitely... Something that is not encouraged in, our encouraged in our classrooms anymore. There isn't time. Never mind the fact that they really don't want them to think critically, because God forbid they do that. They might disagree with the nonsense that's being ta taught in the classroom. <clears throat> you might end up with situations where the school principal is calling the parent and saying, you know, we, we do have learning materials when it comes to American history. Your, your, your child does not need to bring in pamphlets from national parks or copies of the Constitution. Welcome to my world. Yeah, of course, I laughed at them. <laughs> and yeah, by the way, get, get yourselves copies of the Constitution. All manner of different places you can get them. Get them. And I mean the little booklet form. If, especially if you have kids. Yeah. Because when the whole Second Amendment thing, the guns are just for militias, comes up, and it will. You can send that in with your precious little angels and, you know, highlight it. Say, no, it, it does mention militias, but it's not only for that. Just saying. Because, you know, an armed society is a civilized society. We have learned this in a lot of places in this country. 
you will never stop the crazy. However, you will be able to stop a great deal of the criminality. Crazy criminals, not so much. Standard criminals, sure. You have more people armed in your community. The criminals are less likely to attempt crime. They will be more concerned with keeping themselves breathing. They will not engage in crimes with weapons or otherwise when people are around. And let's be honest. We, we all know uh, there's going to be stealing. Things can be replaced. Insurance companies don't like it when you say this, but that's what you have insurance for. But insurance can't replace people. Anyway, I was talking about Common Core, the, you know, favorite topic of Jeb Bush. Yeah. I'm sorry. <clears throat> I, I mean, I'm ambivalent about the whole concept of having federal standards, particularly in math and science. And for that matter, English. Of course, I would prefer to see something that we're not seeing. And I don't expect to see from this government or like from this administration or the next or possibly ever. But that gets into a whole other issue on top of the whole common core. And that is to see English declared our official language and actually, oh, I don't know, require that they learn it. Require that students learn it, regardless of where they've come from. I'd like to see English as a requirement for citizenship. You have to have a minimum level of fluency in the language, or you cannot become a citizen. That would be nice. I want to see an end to having to search for the English in instruction manuals. I don't have a problem, and I know everybody's going to get mad at me, I don't have a problem with the French that I see all over the place on uh, particularly toiletries. Kimberly Clark is big on this one. But you know why I don't have a problem with it? Because I know that Kimberly Clark produces product for both the United States and French Canadian regions in the same place. <laughs> they are saving money and they're and they're saving me money. They're saving themselves production money. I suppose I wouldn't have a problem with the Spanish on everything if I knew that the company was trying to save a dime because they're producing product that is going to be sent to Mexico. I, I don't like it simply because it's going to end up in Texas. Really don't. Sorry. Or Arizona or California or whatever. I know that sounds racist, but we started doing it wrong a while ago. And Common Core is part of it. The whole one size fits all on one thing, but not on something on something where it really matters. Yeah, we want one size fits all on education, in theory, which, by the way, doesn't work. We don't want to increase the standards for our teachers, but we're going to increase the standards for our students, and we're going to expect a different response. <laughs> Definition of insanity. Thank you. No. Anyway, as for Pearson and. I mentioned on the Facebook, if you were paying attention, the Project Veritas video that I would love to see, that I know can't happen, and it's not picking on Project Veritas. This is just the nature of the beast. There is no way for them to infiltrate. It just can't happen. The, the only way that Project Veritas is ever going to do this is if they would manage to figure out where these people were going to meet and managed to install hidden cameras and microphones. That's it. 
they are not going to be able to get a person to infiltrate. So what I'd love to see is meetings with Pearson and McGraw-Hill and um, Holt, whatever, whoever's still standing, because basically the publishing industry is like a lot, a lot of other industries. You have to keep a scorecard. Who owns whom? They're always switching. There, There's always these buyouts. But the point is, the textbook and the test corporations. Pearson does both. The other ones, they do textbooks. I'm going to tell you right now, if the American public knew what goes on, what the private conversations are, quote-unquote private, with these people, I have a sneaking suspicion there would be a massive uprising by parents, basically telling the schools, you better find a, a different place to get our textbooks. We do not want you teaching our children from these. Just saying. The nepotism is deep. The money is deeper. The gamesmanship is ridiculous. And the politicizing of basic skills for the purposes of, I presume, indoctrination, which, you know, the crazy people say that. The schools are indoctrinating our kids into liberal values. Yes, they are. It's highly intentional. It is extremely dangerous. And basically it is making sure that we have a vast majority of students in this school, in in this country, never be able to question authority. The minority who will question authority will become our leaders or will be in our jails. That's it. There is no middle ground, folks. Dewey's dream is realized. You know, the grandfather of, or the father of modern education. Dewey, the Dewey Decimal System, yeah. They wanted to create a mass of workers and consumers. We're we're talking about in the age of Carnegie and Scaife. Remember the evil corporate barons that oppressed the people? Gotta love the irony that the people today who want them to be so progressive and hate capitalism are using the very same tactics that those evil corporate barons use to get labor. Wow. Isn't that great? See, I've been saying for a while now, we're in Alice in Wonderland. World's upside down. Anyway, it's the bottom of the hour. So, after the news, I'm going to talk about something that doesn't make me angry or depress me. Or at least I'll try. So, be right back. This is Vigilant Liberty Radio News from Independent Journal Review for January 29th. A Texas judge has refused to dismiss the abuse of power case against former Governor Rick Perry. The legal team defending Perry argued the law was applied unconstitutionally and the indictment should be thrown out. In the ruling, the judge noted three points. First, the state law does not allow a judge to determine constitutionality at this point in the legal process. The indictment process must be amended to properly address a concern raised by the defense, and one of the felony charges should be reduced to a misdemeanor. This abuse of power charge stems from Perry's refusal to give $7.5 million to a program run by Travis County DA Rosemary Lemberg. 
Lemberg was arrested on drunk driving charges, and Perry used his constitutionally authorized veto power to pressure her to resign. Lemberg did not. New Governor Greg Abbott immediately released a statement on the ruling, calling Perry's indictment outrageous and inappropriate. California Senator Mark Leno has sponsored a bill that would treat e-cigarettes no differently from regular tobacco cigarettes in the state of California, effectively forbidding them in workplaces, hospitals, bars, public transit, and schools. In a press release, Leno said, quote, Like traditional cigarettes, e-cigarettes deliver nicotine in a cloud of other toxic chemicals, and their use should be restricted equally under state law in order to protect public health. While the health risks of traditional cigarettes are well documented, there is not similar information about e-cigarettes. And a study from the University of California noted it is not clear if e-cigarettes have toxicity similar to that of the conventional cigarette smoke. A spokesman for the e-cigarette industry said the bill threatened a product that has helped many smokers quit a harmful habit. Cuban President Raul Castro has given a list of demands to the United States ahead of any talks to normalize relations between the two nations. One of the demands includes returning Guantanamo Bay to Cuba. Other demands called for the U.S. to stop supporting dissidents of the Cuban government, remove Cuba from the list of state sponsors of terror, and to stop broadcasting anti-Castro radio and television. Castro said, absent any resolutions to these problems, diplomatic efforts between the U.S. and Cuba would be meaningless. The United States State Department has yet to respond to the demands. And a California high school is a subject of parental outrage after Planned Parenthood sent two sex ed instructors to Accolades Union High School. Parents demanded the curriculum be made available for viewing and parental approval, along with the employment background of the instructors. The two instructors had questionable side jobs. One led adult toy workshops, and the other is a self-described, quote, pleasure activist. One angry parent said Planned Parenthood is, quote, a business. It's a business that sells sex. It's a way to get clientele and sexualize young people. Outraged parents hired conservative legal firm, the Pacific Justice Institute, to petition the school for a new curriculum. The school released a statement informing parents the two instructors would no longer be teaching the course. This has been Amy Curtis with your Vigilant Liberty Radio News from Independent Journal Review for January 29th. Hi, this is Jason Dibbler, co-host of Q with a View, heard every Tuesday night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time on FTR Radio. Right now, FTR needs your help in making the jump into the 21st century through some long-needed equipment upgrades. This is where you, the great and loyal listeners of Great Conservative Talk Radio, can really lend a hand. Visit GoFundMe.com slash Help Upgrade FTR right now. Your assistance, no matter how small, will help to ensure that FTR can continue to offer some of the best conservative radio on the interwebs. Your donation of $50 gets you up to 60 seconds of airtime on FTR radio four times for a hundred dollars your ad will run 10 times or if you don't want to run an ad you can have 30 minutes of ftr airtime to talk about anything you want there are other thank yous for other levels of giving as well but those are some pretty great offers we hope you'll consider making a small donation to help keep quality conservative talk radio alive and thriving on the internet visit gofundme.com slash help upgrade ftr today thank you Hi, this is Steve Hamilton, Station Director at AltCon Radio. And that sultry voice you're listening to is Liz Harrison on The Liz Harrison Show. back and I'm going to do a little housekeeping. If you're on Facebook, you need to be looking for Vigilant Liberty Radio and the Liz Harrison Radio Show. I like those pages. Come on, folks, really. Otherwise, you're listening to this thanks to Spreaker and, well, it, it would be a good idea. It helps us out. If you all visit Vigilant Liberty Radio there, 
you can do that fairly easily. And go and uh, like us there. Follow us there. Uh, there's a good reason why I say that. I, I, you enjoy our programming. The more people that we have following us, the better off we are. We are able to reach more people that way. Because, you know, it's all about the numbers. We know how this works. And then on Twitter, of course, at Vigilant Liberty. And I, I think just about everybody knows I'm at Goldwater Gal there. Anyway. We have an interesting situation going on when it comes to foreign policy, nasty stuff going on overseas. Well, not necessarily our foreign policy. The foreign policy of Jordan. Yeah. It, it seems when they draw a red line, they really mean it. Maybe Obama could go there and take a lesson. ISIS set a, a sundown deadline, and nothing has happened so far. I have been, you know, going to the Google and re resetting the search and double-checking to see if there have been un any updates. There aren't. Sundown has come and gone. The threat from ISIS was that they would kill the Jordanian pilot if they did not get the woman that they wanted. You know, the bombing woman. I'm not saying her name because I don't like... It, it turns these people into rock stars. You know what I mean? I, I don't like doing that. When we have mass killers here in the U.S., I don't say their names. They're felons. They wanted their 15 minutes of fame by killing people. So I don't give it to them. So I'm not going to say her name. Anyway. They want this evil terrorist woman. She was sentenced to death. Jordan has not budged because the only thing ISIS has offered is a photograph that does not offer a proof of life. For those of you who saw the Hollywood version of proof of life, you know, Meg Ryan, Russell Crowe, a proof of life in this case if they if they did not put him on video because they had beat the crap out of him and they didn't want Jordan to know this, the thing they could have done was, you know, have a photograph of him, you know, covered him with stage makeup or something, or had something that showed the, an identifying factor that would show it was him. Um, and then have some dated material usually a newspaper, that would show he was still alive. Now, the fact that they have not given Jordan, or given Jordan proof of life makes me think maybe this guy was already dead and they were just trying to, you know, get a living woman for a dead body. Who knows? I'm not going to try to climb into the mines of ISIS. That, that is dangerous ground. Bottom line remains, Jordan is not budging. Japan is not budging, or at least they're following suit with Jordan. This is how it's done, folks. I mean, yeah, they were they were willing to deal with them to a certain extent, and I can understand why. But they weren't willing to give away everything without proof that they were going to get what they were after. You know what I mean? So... We're going to have to wait and see how this turns out. I hope that this doesn't turn out badly, but whatever. On, much, on a much lighter note, Tom Petty is in the news. He got in the news because Sam Smith, an artist from Great Britain, I believe, he... Um, sort of kind of did a song that sounded a lot like a Tom Petty song. Now, this happens a lot, by the way. Sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's unintentional. And sometimes it causes legal issues, and in this case, Smith was saying that he was going to pay Petty. Royalties. You know. Well, 
nothing was said about Petty for a while. You know, they they were talking about Smith and the song sounding similar and what's he going to do about it? Well, today, Tom Petty on TomPetty.com made a public statement. And here it is. About the Sam Smith thing. Let me say I have never had any hard feelings towards Sam. All, all my years of songwriting have shown me these things can happen. Most times you catch it before it gets out the studio door, but in this case it got by. Sam's people were very understanding of our predicament, and we easily came to an agreement. The word lawsuit was never even said, and was never my intention. And no more was to be said about it. How it got out to the press is beyond Sam or myself. Sam did the right thing, and I have thought no more about this. A musical accident, no more, no less. In these times we live in, this is hardly news. I wish Sam all the best for his ongoing career. Peace and love to all. Tom Petty. Now there's class. And as for the press, shame on you. Shame on you. Really. I understand. You might have realized that it sounded like the Tom Petty song. But did you really have to go there? (laughs) Did you really have to go there? And, by the way, Sam Smith added Tom Petty to the songwriting credits on his hit, Stay With Me. Okay? It sounds remotely similar to I Won't Back Down, by the way, in case you were forgetting. Uh, There's a limited number of musical notes out there and a limited number of musical note combinations. And granted, it goes way up there into the millions. But because of the way the human ear hears things... It occasionally happens. Ah, give me a break. And the sad part is that this was all about two artists who were arguably classy. They tried to turn it into something nasty. (laughs) And it didn't work. Nanner, nanner, nanner. You didn't win, media. Nice try. Maybe next time you got to wait for somebody who's going to get really fighting mad. I'm thinking Taylor Swift there, and that's not picking on her by any means. It's just pointing out the obvious. I mean, if the woman yanks all of her music from Spotify because she doesn't like the low level of pay that they offer, it's a fair guess that if somebody went and did something similar to her work, she's not going to be real happy about it. Anyway, Uh, onward and upward. Uh, Oh, only one other thing. If you catch it on the YouTube, I think you might be able to find it if you search for um, Tom Brady parody song, Beat Tom Brady. They did a parody song, and it's like a Sam Smith song. It might be this one, too. I'm not sure. I didn't pay attention. But I liked the song. (laughs) Because I hate Tom Brady! And that's the end of me saying anything about sports, because I'll just get depressed. Anyway, speaking of depressing, uh, this was something that I wanted to bring up before. Matt Vespa brought it up over on Town Hall. And this was back on, what, the 23rd? And Legal Insurrection was deep in the coverage on this and quite a few other places. But uh, over at Town Hall, Matt was kind enough to show all of the court documents. Of course, there's a lot of black line through there to cover the names of certain individuals. But there was an affidavit in support of an arrest warrant against, wait for it, David Gregory of NBC News. Legal Insurrection filed a FOIA request for all the documents regarding this uh, investigation. Professor William Jacobson there, to be exact, And they got their information. But the bottom line is that the D.C. Attorney General, Irvin B. Nathan, 
said that Gregory was just too nice a guy and had no criminal intent. And what did he do wrong? He had a large capacity um, clip, high capacity ah, ammunition magazine, to be exact, on NBC's Meet the Press. He was doing this, you know, for a show and tell. Okay? And the best part is that NBC asked the authorities. This, of course, is illegal in D.C. The show was filmed in D.C., so... Um, Yeah, they did this, and they asked permission... Uh, from the law enforcement, they asked if there would be a problem, and they were told it would be a problem. They were It was suggested that they use photographs. Now, personally, my suggestion would have been, you know, this is NBC, folks. Why don't you just film in a studio somewhere other than D.C. for that week? Because <laughs> you have how many of them where the magazine isn't illegal? Just saying. You know, that would have been a good idea. But anyway, uh, this is a tip sheet story in case you're trying to really find it. But any, And it's titled, what, D.C. Police Wanted to Charge David Gregory. D.C. A.G. Killed the Request because he's a nice guy. In other words, the law applies only if you're not our friend. David Gregory is arguably a friend of the A.G., so we're not going to go and get him in trouble. This was when he was speaking with NRA Executive Vice President Wayne LaPierre. And the statute is pretty straightforward. No person in the district shall possess, sell, or transfer any large capacity ammunition feeding device, regardless of whether the device is attached to a firearm, which it wasn't. So just the magazine is illegal. Not allowed in city limits. Gotta love it, folks. Can we say it's time for the NRA to dump some money in the concept of beating up that law? I mean, after all, you had a really good witness there, William LaPierre, or Wayne LaPierre. That's a damn good witness, folks. Wayne LaPierre, you need to go back. Go back to D.C. Let's have a chat about that one. Question the constitutionality of the law, I suppose. I wanted to get to that yesterday, and I didn't. And what else is going on? Oh, yeah. Disney is getting ready for the 60th anniversary of Disneyland. This is the good news. The bad news. 95 people have the have the measles and it's directly associated with some sort of contact that they had with somebody in Disneyland. Oops. Now, I know that people are screaming bloody murder about the don't do the vaccine people, you know, the crazy people, the evil vaccine is going to hurt your children. You're going to end up with an autistic child. Yes, really you will. No, you won't. Um, yeah, the vac- anti-vax people really need to be shut down. I, I'm really for freedom of speech and all of that until it crosses the line of harming public health. Then I'm not so happy about it. And and it is all about the whole your rights end where my rights begin. You know, you have the right to go and say what you want to say, but if what you are saying is going to have extremely negative consequences for others that would be through no fault of their own, and this is a great example of it, you really shouldn't be saying it. You really should not be saying it. I'm sorry, the science does not back you. So, please stop. And also, if you didn't exist, we might be having a meaningful conversation about why this probably happened, which we're not, because we're all assuming, or at least the the, uh, media is, because it would take too much work to figure out otherwise, and I'm not sure that they could, because you're talking about 
medical histories of citizens or non-citizens. Yeah, we know where we're going here. It's funny. Because we've had these vax people, you know, the anti-vax people for a long time now. But I can't recall a breakout like this of the measles. So what is different? Could it possibly be all of those unattended children that we had dumped in this country from Central America? Where, by the way, they don't necessarily get vaccines. And is it fair to guess that a relatively high number of these children were dumped in California, where Disneyland happens to be? Yep. In case you were wondering, you know, there there is stuff about the whole idea of spreading of disease thanks to these children. Look up Cheryl Atkinson. She was talking about another disease, of course, but... Maybe she started digging into this. We can hope. Maybe she'll come up with something. But seriously, folks, you have to wonder. We don't have proof, but you have to wonder. It's irresponsible. Uh, It's filed under, well, at least I hope it's filed under unintended consequences. I would like to think that there is no one in this administration that would intentionally bring children from Central America into this country in the general hope that not only would they end up staying here, but would also spread disease. That That's a really dark place to go. I would like to ha- think that we have at least a minimum level of humanity and decency in our government. I hope I'm not proved wrong. Just saying. So before I get really angry, I'm going to go and go to something that was really amusing to me on the Facebook. Bring Jay Leno to the Fox network. This is a page. It's listed as a TV show. Of course it isn't yet. A short description of it is Jay Leno is being replaced at NBC by tyrants because he has morals. We say bring Jay Leno to late night TV on Fox and destroy them and others to make him the king of late night TV again. Uh, Paging Roger Ailes. (laughs) I'm serious. this, This actually, in my mind, is a really good idea. Maybe we need to, like, interrupt that whole rebroadcast schedule on the Fox News. Start it later. Slot in Leno. Maybe even make Red Eye a little bit earlier. I I know there might be people who would yell at me for that. But, hey, maybe a 2 a.m. start for the Red Eye. Midnight to 1 with Jay Leno. Hmm... Does this sound like something that might work? That would be very cool. I, I'm I'm serious. This this might this might be good. I'm I'm curious to see whether or not they could pull it off. I don't know if Leno would actually agree. I would hope he would. Arguably, he's funnier than just about anybody out there. The only other person who I I've been moderately amused with, which I'm biased, is Craig Ferguson. But that's because he's Scottish. I'm Scottish, so... Or at least my my ancestors came from Scotland. So I have a little warm spot in my heart for the Scots. They, they are more amusing to me. They are more talented to me for whatever reason. And yeah, I like Sean Connery too. So no surprise that I like Ferguson. But Leno, I actually did like a lot of the time, except for when it was obvious that he was stuck on some sort of screwed up and <laughs> screwed up script handed to him by NBC. You know what I mean? When I knew it was truly just Jay talking, let's put it that way. Because I, I, I let's be honest. Regardless of how his ratings were or anything else, he he was toast at NBC because he just didn't agree with their nonsense 
they really, <laughs> really screwed up. And, you know, Roger Ailes, he, he was looking for a way to reach another group. Get more fans for the Fox News. This might be the way to do it. I mean, really, this this is how you do it, folks. Megyn Kelly reaching out and doing stuff that's off the wall, ticks off the conservative base. I think that Jay Leno might be good. Because, yeah, he might tick off the conservative base here and there. But by and large, he would not come off as a complete liberal squish. Or at least I think he wouldn't. This might be it, folks. Maybe you need to go and do the whole, Hey, Fox News, why don't you get Jay Leno? Uh, there aren't very many people who are into this yet. It, 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 and honestly, I got it promoted to me by the uh, Facebook itself. You know, where they say suggested pages. And they're usually completely off. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, the, uh, 1,582 likes, so I, I, I'm going to be nice. Uh, here I go. Click like, because I, I like this idea. And on the 27th, I, I love what they put up. <laughs> love it. The, and it was from, uh, Breaking Obama, but it said, if Obama had a son, I bet he wouldn't look like this. And it shows a black man in a Marine uniform. And they're damn straight. No chance would he have a son in the Marines. Just saying. Anyway, I, I like the concept. I, I would love to see him do it. I doubt that I will. But hey, why not? This is filed under... Maybe if enough people go and say... We want Jay Leno on Fox News. We want a late night comedy show. We want late night TV other than Red Eye. We love Greg Gutfeld. That's not going to change. Greg Gutfeld will always be great and Red Eye will always be great. But we need this. Because, you know, it's Jay Leno. And we can all thumb our noses at NBC again. That's the bonus point, right? Anyway, it's getting to be about that time. Coming up at 2 o'clock Eastern is the right mics. Uh, coming up this evening, I believe at 9 o'clock, for those of you who are Jazz Shaw fans, I think that the uh, Politinerds should be coming out with Doug Maticanis. Then at 10 o'clock, America Our Way, with Dustin Hoyt. And at 11 o'clock, There Must Be Pie, simulcast with FTR, The Right War, Freedom Works Night. I, ha I am still relatively under the weather, so we'll have to see what happens when Jason and I are on the air. I'll tell you right now, last night was, was a hoot. If you missed it, you want to go to VigilantLibertyRadio.us and catch up on it. Have a good one, folks. I'm out of here.